Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I join others in acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands where we're meeting here in Sydney, the Gadigal people, but also of all the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waters of those who are joining us from all around Australia. I am grateful, Maxine, for that kind introduction, and I am truly pleased to be here and to have been invited as Australia's National Soils Advocate to talk to you about soils and contribute to this 2022 National Land Care Conference. My association with land care goes back more than three decades to the early 1990s when I was Australia's ambassador for the environment, dealing with something called the UNSAID process, spelt U-N-C-E-D, UN Conference for Environment and Development, not nonverbal, which produced Agenda 21 and the three landmark UN conventions, environment conventions, on climate change, biodiversity, and desertification. In that capacity, I've got very vivid and warm memories of addressing the 1994 Land Care Conference at the Rest Point Casino in Hobart. The theme was Land Care in the Balance. In fact, I've still got and still wear the conference sweatshirt and I was really tempted to wear it here today for, however, for uh, dramatic impact, it would have been no match whatsoever for the bright green jacket that Andrew Campbell sported at last night's welcome reception. Although I did bring along, as part of a small show and tell, the land care book that was launched at that conference by Andrew and Greg Seepin, which remains still today one of my absolute go-to references on land care. The message that I delivered at that 1994 conference was a very positive one, full of good news and reporting proudly to what was then the burgeoning national land care community about the way that the then unique Australian land care model had been embraced by the international community, its philosophy and principles woven in particular into the language of the convention to combat desertification in those countries experiencing serious drought and or desertification. Today, as National Soils Advocate, I've got a good news, bad news message to deliver on the subject of soils. In the uh, spirit of the storytelling that uh, Costa's urging on us all, I took my inspiration not from a picture of a rainbow and clouds, but from the compelling opening lines of Charles Dickens' story, A Tale of Two Cities. I'm sure that many of you here will know them. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. The good news for anyone who works with soil and wants to see its value better recognized and appreciated is that soil finally finally is claiming more attention from policymakers, nationally and internationally. Long the forgotten resource under our feet, unseen, ignored, dismissed as just dirt. Awareness now of the multiple services that soils provide and of the critical role that healthy soils play in the cycles that sustain life on earth has increased significantly in recent years. A variety of factors have contributed to this change. 
advocacy has certainly played an important part, led here in Australia, in, in addition to my own office of the National Soils Advocate, by a range of soil-focused organisations and agencies, including Soil Science Australia, the Soil CRC, uh, some, in fact, an increasing number of universities, and importantly, a number of not-for-profit organisations, most notably Soils for Life and the Maloon Institute, both of them dedicated to the task of regenerating Australia's soils and landscapes. Overseas, beyond the Global Union of Soil Scientists, the, it's called the International Union of Soil Scientists, and some active national and regional organisations, for example, the Soil Institute in the United States and the Living Soils of the Americas program, involving all the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. The charge, the advocacy charge, has been led by the Global Soil Partnership. Founded in 2012 and hosted by the FAO, this collaborative network, which is unusually open to governments, regional organisation, institutions and individuals, I'm an independent partner, for example, as is our CSIRO, and interestingly, when I checked it out, the land care network, soil land care network of New Zealand also belongs, so land care Take note. But this organisation is something that is playing a really pivotal role. It has two key objectives. To position soils on the global agenda. As many of you know, I was a diplomat for 40 years and everything in diplomacy and influencing policy is about positioning yourself effectively to influence the policy process. So two key goals, to position soils in the global agenda and promote sustainable soil management. It is a really active, flourishing network doing a great job of awareness raising. But the essential drivers of the greater attention being paid to soil that have made it a higher priority for policymakers in Australia and elsewhere are the multiple pressures, concerns and challenges that Mark Howden talked about in his keynote opening address this morning, linked predominantly but not exclusively to our changing climate and also to the dawning realisation by governments that paying more attention to soil is not an optional add-on, but a necessity, a fundamental part of addressing these challenges. The nexus between healthy soil and agriculture, productivity and food supply has long been understood and accepted. I think it's fair to say that until quite recently, at least for policymakers, it has dominated thinking about soils and soil management. And I venture to suggest our national narrative about soils. But what the UN now refers to as the climate emergency has changed, is changing this. No longer is soil seen only through the prism of agriculture. Its role in the soil, water, atmosphere equation in regulating climate in storing and releasing carbon is becoming much better understood and debated, as is the possibility of managing soil to meet emissions reductions targets. Hence, the surge of interest in soil carbon and carbon management in Australia and elsewhere, of which all of you will be well aware. In addition to this new focus on soil carbon in the context of climate change and the more extreme weather events this is generating around the world, awareness 
is also growing, especially, especially here in Australia, in this drought, flood and bushfire prone country, continent, that healthy soils are a key to building resilience to natural disasters. And in the wake of the COVID pandemic, attention is beginning to focus, although not sufficiently yet from my viewpoint, on the connection between soil health and human health. Healthy soils, healthy people, healthy planets. All these factors contributed to the decision that Australia should develop a national soil strategy. Released, and that was referred to, I think, by Andrew Metcalf this morning as a real breakthrough at the national level. Released in May 2021, endorsed, very importantly, by all jurisdictions, every single state and territory, and that's a first. The strategy is a 20-year strategy that sets out how Australia will value, manage and improve its soil. Its vision is large and ambitious. That, and I quote, Australia's soil is recognised and valued as a key national asset by all stakeholders. That it is better understood and sustainably managed to benefit and secure our environment, our economy, our food, our infrastructure, our health, biodiversity, and our communities, now and in the future. It's got, it's a very readable thing. I commend it absolutely to you. Very attractive book, and I think you should have it by your bedside and just dip into it and look at some of these case studies. It's, it truly is very readable. It uh, has three key goals, uh, and this is of high relevance to many of you. Number one, prioritise soil health. Number two, empower soil innovation and stewards. And we've been hearing a lot about that empowerment over the last, uh, last night and today. And thirdly, strengthen soil knowledge and capability. Now, that vision and these goals and objectives are all very pleasing, good words, and they're certainly a part of my good news for soil story, but the effort of implementing this strategy, of turning these good words, those three goals and 12 objectives set out in the strategy into concrete, practical action, still lies essentially before us. Work is now underway on a national action plan for its implementation, again involving all states and territories, so watch this space for further news. Another part of the good news of the best of times in the last couple of years for soils in Australia at the national level was the decision to make the position of a national soils advocate a permanent one. This position is a world first. It's still unique, although uh, there are a number of other countries who are very interested in it and are considering following Australia's example, notably Canada and the UK. The other development at the national level has been the establishment of several parliamentary friends groups, all of them focused on soil and land management. The first was the Parliamentary Friends of Regenerative Agriculture, launched in November 2020 on World Agriculture Day. The second one was a new Parliamentary Friends of Soil group launched in December 2020 on World Soil Day with considerable fanfare at Old Parliament House. And a few months later, in March 2021, the Parliamentary Friends of Landcare. I attach high importance to these bipartisan groups and given their complementary goals and similar purpose, I'm going to be doing my utmost as National Soils Advocate to encourage them to work together 
as much as possible to help drive soils even higher up the policy agenda. The need to do that brings me to the bad news, worst of times aspect of my presentation. Most specifically to the assessment in the latest State of the Environment report about which we're going to be hearing more uh, at this conference, including from one of its three lead orders, uh, authors, Dr Ian Creswell, of the State of Australia's Soils. Australia's ancient soils rank among the most nutrient poor in the world. They have suffered degradation essentially since the time of European settlement in 1788 which saw rapid, broad-scale land clearing and the introduction of farming practices not well suited to Australia's environment. On our journey to become the sophisticated agricultural powerhouse that Australia is today, mistakes were made, including inappropriate land clearing and misguided assumptions about the capacity of our soils to withstand and support long-term intensive agricultural practices. And now, despite many years of research, 36 years of land care, and a series of soil conservation programs, despite a high level of will by many farmers and land managers to do better, through the adoption of better practices, and despite the growing awareness of the value of soil that I've described, the recently released State of Environment report painted a truly grim picture. Our soils are in trouble. They're assessed as poor and deteriorating, leaving what our new Minister for the Environment, Tanya Plibersek, described in her address to the National Press Club, which I expect many of you saw, our soils with a diminished ability to regenerate and support life. Stark words. The reasons are many, but Paradoxically, perhaps, given that climate change has been one thing that has helped to drive soils up the policy agenda, its impacts present serious threats to our soils and to soils worldwide. Most obviously, with extreme weather events, the new normal, climate change will affect soil erosion patterns caused by both wind and water. We can expect more dust storms, more desertification, more soil contamination, and I heard one reference to that, I think, earlier this morning, and greater sediment loads in our rivers. It's a troubling picture. Equally worrying is the way that the change to hotter and drier climates, and you all saw that truly dramatic map with the reds and the oranges and those tiny little patches of blue, the way that the change to hotter and drier climates is changing how carbon cycles through the environment and the soil and affecting the ability of the soil to hold soil organic carbon. The soil aficionados and the gardeners among you, Costa included, know that soil organic carbon is a key indicator of soil health associated with many critical soil functions and attributes. Nutrient availability, high biological activity, soil physical structure, water holding capacity, and aeration. And all of you will know and understand just how serious it is that soil organic carbon is declining almost universally. Without remediation, this decline will continue. But remediation is possible. The State of Environment report recognised this in its statement that, quote, immediate action with innovative management and collaboration can turn things round. Which brings me back to Dickens and finally, 
to Landcare, in particular to the reference in the opening paragraph in the tale of two cities to the spring of hope. For me, and clearly for many others here today, land care is one of the reasons for hope and will be an important part, must be an important part of the collaborative effort needed to turn things around. It has proved itself a powerful force in the past and as we've heard so many people comment last night and this morning, it is needed now more than ever to shape the future. Mark Howden said this morning that the future is ours to choose. He also said that soil is a big part of solving the problems that humanity faces. As Australia's national soils advocate, my request to you, to the land care community and the thousands of members and supporters, the volunteers who animate this exceptional national network, is that as you make these choices, that you factor soil and soil health into your thinking and your activities, acknowledging not only the importance of protecting and restoring Australia's soils for the benefit of all Australians, but the absolute truth of the message that paying more attention to soils will be a big part of solving the problems that humanity faces. Thank you.